This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 458, recorded on September 8th, 2017. This episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense, the agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department, hosts the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Find out more at cbdstconference.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining us today right here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. I should say joining me today. Joining you, that's right. So far, it's only one. <laughs> this is true. Now, after that, we can say us, right? We can. Are you well? We are now. I'm very well, thank you. You were just outside. I was. Weather nice? It's beautiful outside. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, well, what you think is beautiful is like no, no, 20 degrees and dry. Right? No, no, it's it's about 75 degrees outside Fahrenheit. There's almost no humidity. There's a nice breeze. It's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. Perfect. Yeah, just like that, we're into fall. We are. I've got my wool shirt on. You're ridiculous. My wife bought this for me. It's a wool nice shirt. Pendleton shirt. Plus, you've got an undershirt under it. Well, not an undershirt. It's just a T-shirt. And you've got leather things on your elbow. Leather patches. Isn't that academic? <laughs> also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you brought me in because I wanted to laugh so hard about the leather patches <laughs> being <laughs> academic. <laughs> Maybe that should be my uh, nickname, Old yeah. Leather Patch. <laughs> you, have, you have a jacket with those too, right? I do. I used to. I don't know anymore. It's so stereotypical. It is. It truly is. Welcome it's... back, Kathy. Thanks. It's nice where, to be Where down. were you, all over the U.S.? Uh, this time I was in Zion National Park. Oh, nice. North Rim of the Grand Canyon. Oh, nice. Bryce oh, Canyon and uh, visiting friends in Tucson. Nice. Fabulous. Yeah. All very hot places, except Great. for one very cold morning bike riding in Zion, uh, in Bryce. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I miss the hot weather. So sad to see the humidity go. I really do yeah. like it. You, know, you rarely well, hear that I nowadays. Love it. I love it. <laughs> right now, here, it's yes. 62 degrees Fahrenheit, 17 oh. Celsius. Pretty cool. And That's it's chilly. been chilly yeah, all yeah. this week. Yeah. Good football weather. Yeah. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's um, it's clouding over a little bit here. It's 70 Fahrenheit, 21C. Um, might get a few showers this afternoon, but... Um, Happily, I'm not in uh, the Bahamas or Cuba <laughs> or right. Miami or any place else on this uh, yeah. scary-looking map. <laughs> it's also joining us go. from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hey, How you doing? Doing good. I yeah. got uh, 81 degrees, and uh, that's 27C and a cloudless sky. It's been gorgeous weather here. It was... Uh, like 57 degrees this morning. This is unseasonably cool for Austin, so I'm told, though my daughter also suspects that we are out of the nastiest part of uh, summer now and <laughs> on our way home towards nice weather. Has all the water drained away from your neighborhood? Uh, well, we yes. Uh, and, you know, uh, Austin in general and our place in particular uh, was spared the worst of the hurricane. I've seen... I've seen worse flooding just visiting uh, at times before we actually moved here. So we did okay. Good. However, your old town is not going to do okay. I'll tell you that uh, uh, Hurricane Irma, uh, as I was telling you before the show, is charted right now to go right over my old house. Yeah. And so I have uh, all of my friends from Gainesville uh, are in jeopardy. Uh, my I brother you lives. you were going to say are in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. that would be good uh my brother lives uh uh on the coast fernandina beach Ooh. and um so he's well it's complicated but they're leaving um yeah. and of course the boat that i sail on is tied up in saint augustine i wrote so scott, i wrote scott and in, in uh, sharon this morning and i said hope everything's okay and they said we're we're prepared 
She said, we have things to float on and two Jeeps. <laughs> Rich, we'll the, keep an uh, eye out for the your most, boat. The most recent forecast had, uh, had moved the track uh, west a little bit. Mm-hmm. So the, you know, I would have said previously that Fort Myers was uh, not in, well, I mean, everything is, uh, this is a big storm. Everything is in trouble. Uh, but it's moved just, the, the, the forecast has moved just west of the tip, so it's going to go right over the keys. According to the current forecast, it's been going back and forth. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's no. supposed to be a Category 2 going all the way up the peninsula. Yes. Mm. And is that's it, no it, joke. That's, I've not, you know, we saw on several different occasions with hurricanes coming over. Usually by the time they get to Gainesville, they're they're kind of blown out, okay? And and we're just dealing with tropical forest winds. But they're, they're talking about hurricane forest winds up to uh, 80 miles an hour uh, in Gainesville. So we never saw anything like that. And, of course, you know, Gainesville is, is a forest, these huge trees. So it's well, now serious. Well, now we'll see succession forests. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Well, it's already trashed islands. It's and all of you who listen and are in the path, you know, hope that we we hope you do all right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Really, this is, you know, we are interested in the weather, but we're more interested in your safety. Yes. So good luck with that. Uh, I want to um, just say something I usually say at the end of the show, and that is subscribe to the podcast, please. Uh, the reason I'm asking is because our numbers are are very variable. Some months way up, some months way down. And I don't know why. A lot of podcasters say the same thing. And it's difficult for advertisers because they will give ads to you, but you need to guarantee them a certain number of downloads. And if you don't, then you have to give them another episode or multiple episodes in, where they may not even advertise. So here's the bottom line. When advertisers really want 50,000 downloads minimum per show per week, so we don't do that on any of our shows, but our aggregate for the network, we come close or we exceed, but uh, the variability kills us. So uh, subscribe. I know a lot of you listen on your desktop. So, you know, if you have a smartphone, there are apps, you just subscribe and then they get downloaded automatically and the number gets counted and that could help us a lot. So also, you can, you can, you can still go listen. Sorry, yeah, you, you can, can, still you go can listen, listen to, to it. Desktop. Yeah, listen, no, listen sure. to it on whatever platform you like. Just please go on some device where you can subscribe on it and and subscribe, and that will help us keep the show going without having to burden it, everybody with too many ads. Exactly. Exactly. All right, mm-hmm. Kathy, tell us about this meeting. So the fourth annual, or not? They're not annual, but it's the fourth American Society for Microbiology conference on. Viral man- manipulation of nuclear processes will take place in December 2017, December 3rd to 6th in Charleston, South Carolina. And this is a really great meeting. And so I want to tell you about it because the abstract deadline and travel grant application deadline are coming right up Monday, September 25th, 2017. And so This is a meeting where you can join your peers researching how viruses manipulate cellular processes, focusing on how viruses perturb nuclear functions. The scope is pretty broad, and it embraces diverse virus families, including nuclear DNA and RNA viruses, such as polyoma, papilloma, adeno, and herpes viruses. It also includes HIV and other retroviruses. And it also will include RNA viruses that replicate in the cytoplasm but exploit nuclear functions. And I went to the first of these meetings and found it very useful. And Charleston is a great place. So I highly recommend it. And we have the link in the show notes, but it's http tinyurl.com slash ASM nucleus. So that's pretty easy to remember. You have until September 25th to get in your abstract and travel grant application. Uh, Your Yeah, abstract and travel grant application. So check it out. All right. I'm sad to uh, let you know that virologist Roger Hendricks has died at 75 years of age, 74. 74. He's a virologist working at the University of Pittsburgh, working on bacterial viruses. And he was a PhD student with Jim Watson. Wow. How about that? Wow. I wonder if he knew... Um, 
Um, oh, no, <laughs> John States. Brother, you yeah, asked yeah. him that. <clears throat> you in you the, asked it. I did. Yeah, and he said yes. <laughs> now, what? This was 2011. She hadn't been on Twiv. I wonder why I asked him. You had already done a paper of Jones. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You said. It's a herpes. Uh, mm. Yes, I remember that paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was looking at I was looking at that <clears throat> YouTube uh, post of the uh, episode with uh, Roger, and one of the first things I noticed was that he had a smile on his face the whole, whole time. time. I know. <laughs> you know, it's one one of those guys who's got a smile yeah. on his face the whole time, which you know, happy or amused or something. This uh, o- obituary th- uh, from the Post Gazette that uh, we've linked here uh, is is very nice and 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 tells a lot about him. And he was just. Just one of these people is just a nice man who loved what he did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He, so this was TWIV 135, which we recorded at ASM in New Orleans in 2011 right. with also Harmit Malik and uh, Rachel Katz and Ellen Bogan. And uh, it's a long, longer name than mine. And uh, he was, on, so I've, I've got, uh, he appears at 30 minutes and 34 seconds. Actually, he's on the whole time, but he starts talking at 30, 34. We talk about some cool. He, he's been studying the phage population of a small pool uh, near him for years. And by small, it's less. It's it's a few feet in diameter. You know, it's in a rock somewhere, and it. You know, he's been sampling the phages and studying them, among other things. Oh my goodness! He's a cool guy. Yeah, he was very, very. Yeah, he was smiling. That was amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Happy guy. And apparently, I didn't know this. Uh, according to this uh, obituary, he was also a. Uh, uh, Renaissance music buff and played recorder and uh, clarinet mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. did quite a bit of that. So that's cool. So in the Great. obit, his wife says he never said anything rude about anyone in his whole life. She said she didn't hear him say anything. Wow. Mm. I wish I could say that. Yeah. <laughs> I guess if I really wanted to, I would, right? Well, you yeah. could start now. <laughs> how about it's that? Never too no, late. I don't, I don't how about that could. for a chance? Oh, Alan, you're challenging me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I had never met rude or, or obnoxious people, I wouldn't have said an unkind word either. But <laughs> I haven't been rude to you in a while. You know, uh, that's I've, true. You've been you very nice to Dixon lately. I've been, you know, it. I've been, I've been editing the the lectures that Dixon gave and which I recorded. And you know, before we he starts, it's me talking, and if something goes wrong, and I hear myself yelling at you, and it. <laughs> Terrible. So. <laughs> I took no offense. None. <laughs> You're very None. stolid or stolid yeah. or whatever. Well, no. stoic. <laughs> I try, I try, but I can't say that the people who reject our papers or grants are not going to uh, raise some ire. How can I not? I mean, Hendrix probably never had a paper rejected or a grant rejected. <laughs> oh, that must have. Because <laughs> if he had, wouldn't you say rude things about the people? <laughs> Yeah, you'd be say, tempted to at least. That's you'd say, oh, well, I'd better. Um, uh, exactly, yeah, exactly. You know, there are, there's some people <laughs> like that. It's true. <laughs> Kathy, you never get mad at anyone, right? No. Oh, sometimes I do. Yeah. I, and I always say, that person brought out the worst in me. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <"No."> <laughs> that's good. I mean, I remember that movie, Forrest Gump, and Forrest Gump never got mad at anybody. He was just an even tempered. It's just a movie, Dixon. Yeah, well, he was he was an archetype for lots of people out there, I think. Yeah, I know. There are a lot of them out there. He but... was a highlights reel for the baby boomers and an Oscar ploy. This is all. <laughs> you know, it was just such a cynical movie. Did you I'm write sorry. that? I, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> we have a bunch of follow up today. We do. First from Anthony. When I was looking for Fenner's paper online, Frank Fenner, who played a role in our story of last time with the mixoviruses in rabbits in Australia, I could not find any. As luck would have it, someone soon after handed me a copy (laughs) of the 1957-8 Harvey lectures, one by Frank Fenner. Someone... I don't understand this. So he was looking for a paper and then someone just handed him a Harvey lecture. Right. Oh, you want a Fenner paper here. <laughs> and so he uploaded a PDF of this article. It's a lovely article. It's ah. just, it's him talking, you know, and they recorded it, but mm-hmm. you can see it's someone's having a conversation or talking to an audience. Yeah. And Anthony writes, I believe that the text answers Dr. De Pommier's question about mosquitoes in Australia. And in it, he talks about his studies, which he did near a lake. Yeah, well, that'll do it. So there, but they do have a map of all the parts of mostly southwest, uh, southeastern Australia, yeah, where the study took place. And so that's where the mosquitoes that's, were. That's right. The snowy mountains I, are there. 
I've seen uh, McFadden give a talk about the history of McSoma, where he shows that uh, map. And uh, mm, mm. we've got Australia and this big, huge shaded area in Southeast Australia. And McFadden refers to it as the biggest plaque in the known universe. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I've heard that talk. Yes, yes. It's a good article, though. If you would like to read the history, it's quite nice to read. By the way, the so I I, yes. I I I skimmed this looking for uh, about mosquitoes, and all I could really make out of it is is that yeah, he did he showed a correlation between disease and mosquito population, and he just talked about mosquitoes the whole time. It was uh, fairly clear that uh, from Fenner's point of view, uh, mosquitoes were by far and away the dominant vector. Okay, mm-hmm. mosquitoes all the way down, Dixon. Got it. <laughs> I hear that. But I always think of when I think of Australia and rabbits, I see this big arid plain with just yeah. zillions of rabbits on it, and wonder how could that's you the ever, classic stock photo. That's yes. probably right. <laughs> how could you get a mosquito to to buy into that kind of an environment? <laughs> Be tough. Well, yeah. a lot, a lot of rabbits. A lot of rabbits. Anthony lot continues. By the way, the Australian government was planning to use tilapia virus, studied by Dr. Lipkin, to exterminate. That invasive species. I don't know the status of that process project. I don't know about that one. I do know of the Australia's plan to kill invasive carp using a herpes virus. We we talked about that on a TWIV. We did. I don't remember which one. Of course, we also talked about the tilapia virus, uh, identified by Lipkin and colleagues. I didn't know that uh, that was a problem. Is it they, that's why we eat it to try and get rid of it. <laughs> Twiv three eighty eight. Thank you. Which was titled "What Could Possibly Go Wrong." That's it. So Australia really likes these uh, projects. <laughs> well, yeah. All right, Alan, can you take the next, please? Sure. Uh, Pete writes, "Hi, a lot to do, so keeping this terse." <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> All of the hosts in 457 were pretty dismissive of labeling GMOs for consu- consumers. Alan Dove even said regarding salmon, it's just economic motivation. But that is a very valid reason. If I work in the fishing industry, I should have the ability to boycott the GMO fish and encourage others to do so. I avoid GMO grains, not out of health concerns, but because I'm opposed to enriching Monsanto, the farming practices their GMO products encourage, and the very idea of patenting genes. Can't do that without labeling. Same argument for milk. I care about the lives the cows lead, and I believe organic cows are treated more humanely. They're tastier, too. Finally, a group of PhDs saying the public should not be informed, don't worry your pretty little heads, is bad optics. Mm. Saying you shouldn't know what ju- you shouldn't know just makes people suspicious or angry. Um, oh, somebody just pasted in. Sorry about that. Nice. A bunch <laughs> of peeps. That's cool. Uh, we'll get back to that. But... <laughs> Uh, Note to Alan about bioterrorism. How about these scenarios? And if you do think they're credible threats, don't read them on the air. One, (laughs) cross-country trip visiting farms and spreading hoof and mouth disease. The outbreak in Britain had a severe economic effect. Two, might as well spread some bot flies while you're there. Three, release a box of med flies in California orchard country. Hmm. And then he gives a listener pick. Um, Hmm. And then thanks for all you do. And Dixon is awesome whether you're nice to him or not. Aloha, Pete. (laughs) Uh, Well, starting at the top, Pete... Um, you are certainly free to boycott whatever food products you have a fetish about. Um, that's fine. And we have voluntary labeling for precisely that purpose. In fact, in most supermarkets, you can go in and you can find whole sections of foods um, that, that proudly proclaim that they contain no GMO ingredients. You can <laughs> buy your Ben & Jerry's ice cream that says that they they use only uh, inefficiently produced milk. I'm sorry, milk from cows <laughs> that weren't treated with growth hormone. Right. Um, and so on and on, and that's already in place, and that's totally appropriate. When we're talking about GMO labeling, I assume you're talking about GMO labeling laws, and now we're talking about making policy based on the food fetishes of a small group of people, and I don't think that's appropriate. Mm. Mm-hmm. I do so. feel badly, though, him pointing out that a group of PhDs saying the public should not be informed is bad optics. I so, don't think that's what we were saying, was it? Well, I asked all of you, do you think the salmon should be labeled GMO? And we all said no. Right. Um, which, of course, it's still going to be labeled no matter what we think. But maybe if for, from his point of view, if he wants to know what is GMO so he can boycott it, it has to be labeled, right? Correct. No. 
the burden is on him, since this is his personal vendetta against these products, to decide what he's going to buy and what he's not. The burden is not on all of us to foot the bill to label things based on his personal preferences and his, mm. his desire to boycott something. Okay. I mean, they, we're talking about legally mandated labeling here. And that, I think, sets a much higher bar. You should only do that for something that is a genuine food safety issue. And if it's a genuine food safety issue, then you have to seriously consider whether the, you know, the benefit is worth the risk of even introducing the product. But we have mandatory labeling laws for things like allergens. You know, how many products have you picked up that say this was produced in a plant that also processes peanuts? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the real deal, and that's important. It's critical that we have laws that label foods that way because people who do have severe peanut allergies, that could kill them. It's true. Um, but, but people Ellen, who are a, just what, not what into about, GMOs, that's that's their own problem. What about um, just the labeling of stuff, you know, how much fat, how much salt, how much whatever, you know, is in all our mm -hmm. foods? That That's not there because, in general, because of it, you know, being at dangerous levels. I mean, sometimes it's there and helpful for people who have allergies to uh, MSG or uh, sulfites or things like that. But, you know, what if it were just included in something like that? That's or, just you an still ingredient list. I don't think you need, I, I don't think demanding that ingredients be categorized by exactly how they were produced is an appropriate use of that label. However, you must admit that the label that says organic has a positive economic influence on the sale of the Of course, of an item. which is why I said it was just economic motivation. <laughs> yeah, you have no, a multi billion totally billion dollar industry of organic food exactly. that relies on inflated prices from That's their inefficiently right. produced products. And, and as a result, they, yeah. they hype that. And that is who is lobbying for labeling of GMOs yeah. because it That's would give right. them a further edge in the exactly marketplace. Exactly right. Against and, their primary competition. And the studies are out already that says that there's no nutritional difference between organic and and commercially exactly. grown food. So. Or between um, bovine growth hormone treated milk, you know, cows yeah, milk yeah. and the milk of cows that weren't treated. And so if there's no nutritional difference, then the ingredient is milk or right. the ingredient is corn. It is not corn produced from this particular strain, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we get into that, then we have to go deep on where all these things are coming from, which in the case of things like fish, in a lot of cases, you don't even know. Correct. Uh, Alan, what do you think of his uh, bioterrorism scenarios? I ain't scared. <laughs> <laughs> Step outside and say um, <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, of course, these are all, these are all things, I think you mean foot and mouth disease virus um, mm -hmm. was the one in Britain. But, um, yeah, these are all things that are legitimate threats through a deliberate or, much more likely, accidental release, True. which is why, and Pete signs aloha, I'm wondering if he's in Hawaii, and if he is, he must be keenly aware <laughs> <Bio -invention>. that, <laughs> that every, every state has a state agricultural department and the u.s has a department of agriculture and other nations have their departments of agriculture and one of the major jobs of those departments is to be vigilant for these types of introductions because somebody who was visiting a farm in some other country came you know flew to the u.s and then visited a farm here and next thing you know you've got a disease outbreak so sure there's a risk that we'll have an introduction of any of these things um but when it happens, that will be flagged and dealt with as it as it was when those were endemic diseases. So yeah. one thing that one thing I think this points out is that you know we we're, we're obviously worried about having things labeled GMO because we think of the negative consequences of that. What that points to is the fact that <clears throat> there hasn't been enough education to show that GMOs are generally safe. And that they're biologically okay, and that economically they are probably a plus uh, yes. in many situations. And so it's it's the education thing. And in a climate where we have difficulty propagating all kinds of information about yes. science, I don't know that this is going to change anytime soon. Right. That's what I was thinking of. That 
there's nothing wrong with GMO salmon. And if you put GMO on it, then a lot of people are not going to buy it. Demonized it. Although you might say, what does Vincent care if they buy it or not? So it's a valid point, right? But I'd buy it. No, I think, yeah, I would too. I'd, a, I'd actually a, seek it out. I, that's yeah. a cool idea. There's a subtext, and that is for sure. These are people that are against large corporations like Monsanto and Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland, where uh, you know a lot of agriculture is in the hands of a very few large yes. companies, and and that's a legitimate complaint. But I don't that think that is you, a very legitimate complaint. You don't but you, it, you don't attack it by simply rejecting GMO as a negative thing, right? So, you know, yeah, you don't you don't need to go anti-science to no, convince me right, that Monsanto right. has done some, <laughs> some bad stuff. Exactly yeah, you right. know, they're they're a monopoly and they behave like one. Yeah. And they need to be regulated like one. Yeah, but the, the other thing we seem to forget is that Monsanto is driven by its shareholders and there's millions of them yeah. out there. So if you want to know what Monsanto does, Monsanto does exactly what the shareholders wants it to do. Make money. And Archer Archer Daniels Midland <laughs> is driven by its private owners yeah that's right which no, no, is actually true. worse because right. they're profit motivated and yet not accountable to that's right. anybody that's right so yeah we have we have consolidated our agriculture in the hands of a very small group of very powerful companies yeah. that is a problem mm -hmm. but gmos are not the relevant thing to be discussing we need to yeah, be discussing right. the structural problem that we have created in our right, food totally system good. the lack of a food system that's right yes all right, we'll, we'll return to this with Pete's pick, which we'll read later because yes. it's related. Um, Rich, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Mark writes, the TWIV team, reference TWIV 457, the Red Queen meets the White Rabbit, dear team. I am a longtime listener and sincerely enjoy your show, everyone in it, and I'm always fascinated by the topics you cover. Just a thought on the naming of Myxoma virus. I have, in my youth, shot, culled, rabbits for my brother-in-law on his property in central Queensland. Mm. The tumor-like protuber protuberances do look very ugly. And although I had an interest at the time, I didn't actually touch the lesions. However, to my untrained eye, they did seem to be exuding a mucus-like substance. I'm not sure if it was mucus or perhaps pus. Probably pus. The reason for my letter. Yeah, mucus just comes from places where right. there are mucus producing cells, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is not your skin. Uh, the reason for my letter, I would like to ask for your advice, perhaps help, in regard to the reference. Being an Australian citizen, I have been encouraged by your recent show to write a letter to my parliamentary representative in regard to the fudging of the data, methods, and outcomes of the joint. Sydney Medical School, University of Sydney, uh, Houston, and Penn State et cetera, et cetera. University paper titled, this is the one we did, right. Next Step in the Ongoing Arms Race. Uh, I, the problem I foresee we, we is can that, probably We can probably summarize the gist okay. of this. It's, it's <laughs> basically, he's, he's interested in writing a letter to his um, member of parliament, um, you know, substitute congressman for the u.s or whatever um and the process is that this would be read on the floor of parliament because when constituents write letters they're required to be read um and he is interested in putting together a critique of the paper along the lines of the criticisms that we had in the show um and feels that this is something that should be escalated to the level of uh, of a parliamentary inquiry um, so, and wants our feedback on whether that's a useful thing to do and if so, how to approach it. Right. And in that regard, uh, that paper, there was no real fudging of the data right. or the methods right. or the outcomes. Okay. It was a perfectly legitimate scientific, uh, uh, a paper, uh, study. Uh, our objection to the paper was, uh, over hyping right. the, um, the, the interpretation of the results, the conclusions, right. um, uh, in particular, and, and in fact, what we took the most serious objection to was the press release yes. coming from, uh, Penn state, which of course is not a peer reviewed, um, uh, uh, item. So, or governed uh, by Australian law, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced that, 
uh, this is something that at this point needs to go to the floor of parliament. Okay. And, you know, some of the questions that he asks here, why weren't wild rabbits used? Uh, and, um, let me see. Why did they over? Well, why weren't some some of the things that he talks about about the the, the paper itself? I mean, it's just you know, uh, it's a, they chose to uh, do it the way they did it. Okay, they could do it uh, other ways uh, as well. Uh, uh, maybe there will be follow up studies that uses uh, wild rabbits. It was a complete study in its own right. So there was nothing wrong with the paper. Really, it was just. Uh, just that they were a little too enthusiastic in in hyping the conclusions. Yeah, there wasn't anything that rose to the level of a of an ethical or a legal no. problem. Yeah. I don't think it was just so, irrelevant to the natural situation. But Kathy has something to add. Well, at the end of his letter, he says, "It's funny. I started this letter full of fire and brimstone, yes. but now I'm nearly finished. Now that I'm nearly finished, I'm wondering. I know you're busy. Is this the right fight? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. <laughs> anyway, please me- let me know what you think." Sincerely and with warm regards, Mark. So it sounded like he was pretty upset about this at first, wrote the letter, got it off his chest, and is wondering whether it's really worth pursuing this. And I think, uh, Rich and Alan, you've kind of addressed some of those things in saying that we weren't really thinking, or I wasn't on the show, that you weren't really thinking that data were fudged and so forth and so on, and that maybe this doesn't rise to the level of getting yeah. parliament involved. No, it was a perfectly good paper. As a matter of fact, it was a very interesting paper. The, uh, the, uh, the, the things that they described were quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, they just were a little, a uh, little too enthusiastic in some places in, uh, in hyping the results. That's all. Yes. Reminds me of a quote that Abraham Lincoln was uh, accused of saying once. And that is when you get mad at a good friend, Sit down and write in the nastiest letter you can possibly mm-hmm. write, and then mail it to yourself. <laughs> and he says, right. "By the time it gets back to you, you'll have forgiven your friend, and you'll yeah. be back in a good friendship with him." <laughs> that's good. That's absolutely. That's what happened here. He went yeah. through all this. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, yeah. Uh, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Paul writes, "Dear Twivians, firstly, my apologies for writing twice in one week, a result of missing your podcast last week and listening to them both this week. I'm writing with a listener pick that relates to your rabbit plague." myxomatosis story that you covered in episode 457. It refers to a little-known late 19th century story of the rabbit plague and our first attempts at biological control some 70 to 80 years before the myxoma virus trials. And he thinks that this is little-known, at least outside Australia, come to think of it, maybe somewhat unknown Mm -hmm. here as well. (laughs) Um, It's all laid out in a swashbuckling story in the book Pasteur's Gambit. You can still purchase this great piece of history through Amazon. I thoroughly recommend it. It's a story that involves Pasteur himself and a million-dollar prize, his nephew Adrien Loire, their rivalry with Robert Koch, and the scientific biases that came with that, corruption at high levels, a romantic fling with a beautiful actress, Sarah Bernhardt, who was visiting Sydney at the time of the story, political intrigue, and surprisingly, the first introduction into Australia of the process for making Belgian-style lager. (laughs) (laughs) I won't ruin it for the potential reader by spelling out all the details, but it is truly an amazing story and one that would stretch belief as a fictional movie if it wasn't all true. It also recounts the establishment of a Pasteur Institute on an island in Sydney Harbour, Rod Island, several years before the Paris Institute itself was built. So the first Pasteur Institute in the world was actually established in Australia, although it only lasted for around 11 years. Most of my Pasteur colleagues still don't believe me when I tell them this story. (laughs) An abbreviated version of the story was published in Australian Heritage, attached for your interest and a brief taste, but I would strongly recommend reading the book as well. It's still sunny out there this morning in Brisbane, temperature heading for about 25 degrees Celsius. Best regards. And we have a link to the, uh, I guess, the uh, shorter abbreviated version. So, in fact, uh, Fenner mentioned this in his article that An- Anthony sent us. He mentioned this idea that Loire uh, was sent by Pasteur to try and deal with some infestation. I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was rabbits or something else. Uh, probably rabbits, right? And I think he was bringing in a bacterium. So he went to Australia, but they wouldn't let him bring it in. <laughs> and he sent him back. So it's in the it's in the Fenner story. It's pretty cool. Mm. All right. Uh, we have a snippet. And I thought we would try something a little different. I'm not going to tell you the title of the snippet. 
That way the suspense can build. Ah. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Vincent, that mm. I thought the perfect thing to do would have been to have Daniel Griffin read this uh, thing. <laughs> yeah. It just it had that flavor all through it as I was reading it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is something he could have done. Or we could have read parts and let people guess what it is, but it is published. So yeah. uh, maybe another time we can do that. It's published in Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. And they often publish these case reports. Mm. And this one just came out. October 2016, a male New York resident, 74 years of old, uh, of age, developed fever, myalgia, nausea, and vomiting. He was traveling in Peru three days after visiting the northern Amazon area. And over the, dun, next, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> over the next two days, he had fever, abdominal pain, watery diarrhea, went into a hospital in Peru. They said, we found entamoeba histolytica in your stool. So they gave him IV fluids, antibiotics released a day later, but he didn't get better. So he went back to New York, went to an emergency room where he was found to be uh, afebrile, confused, jaundiced. He had leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, renal failure, liver dysfunction, and metabolic acidosis. This is serious stuff. As we will see. <laughs> yes. Over the next two days, uh, he was transferred to a care center. Over the next two days, he dis he dis de developed intravas disseminated intravascular coagulation. Melina, Which, what is Melina? What is Melina? Uh, Melitia, Melina is tarry stools due to bleeding in the upper digestive tract and disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is abbreviated DIC, right. also goes by the name or the ex expansion of death is coming. Yeah. Disseminated <laughs> intravascular mm. coagulation. Okay. He had multiple episodes of ventricular fibrillation, died three days later. Autopsy revealed GI hemorrhage and hepatocellular necrosis. Right. Test, samples uh, were tested there for a bunch of viral bacterial parasitic agents. They were all negative. Um, he had not received yellow fever vaccine before traveling. Oy. And these specimens were sent to the CDC in Wadsworth, upstate New York, and they tested positive for yellow fever virus. So the if you're going somewhere in the world that has endemic yellow fever, even though this is very rare, you should get your vaccine. Yep. Do you, Dixon? However, if I've you're had over a yellow fever vaccine, if you're over sixty, you may not be able to get it. Mm. So he's seventy-four. How long does it last when you've gotten it? Uh, I think you renew it after ten years. Okay. So I went to Brazil uh, well, when why, I was why? over 60, and I got it. So uh, the guy said, you have to go. You're near the Amazon. You're not going to the Amazon, but you're near enough. Some so countries don't let you in unless you have that vaccination. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so why the why the age cut off, Kathy? Is this because of uh, complications? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think they even mentioned that in this article. Well, they do mention because of serious adverse effects can occur after yellow fever vaccination, contraindications and precautions to vaccinations such as oh, such as patient age should mm -hmm. be considered before administering a vaccine. Uh, this, it has become, um, this was for decades thought to be an extraordinarily safe vaccine, but in the last right. um, uh, maybe 10 years or so, uh, people have become aware that it really does have some serious complications and a low percentage of uh, vaccinees, but um, it does have some serious adverse effects. Can and have. the risk of that probably goes up as your immune system ages. Probably. Probably. We don't. I'm not sure. Dixon, what? You just went to Peru. Did you have a yellow fever vaccine? No. no? We weren't going anywhere near that no. region. We were if in the you, highlands. If you were, would you have gotten a vaccine? I would have thought about it. And then they would have said, how old are you? Yeah. <laughs> I would have said, um, oh, I see. Now, I mean, this is not a, a common occurrence. No. You know, most people recover with mild illness, but 15% um, of cases progress to a more severe form. That's right. Which is what this gentleman had. That's right. So, um, and I think they say in this article that uh, how many cases of uh, 11 yellow fever cases uh, among U.S. and European travelers between 1970 and 2015, so. In 45 very, very years. It's awesome. a lot, lot. Yes. You know, this is amazing when you consider that at the time of the revolution in the United States, they used to regularly evacuate Philadelphia because of true. yellow yes. fever sweeping through every summer. And New York you City know? had a big outbreak. There's a whole book written on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. 
And interestingly enough, in the book, it says that everybody was encouraged to go into their nearest church and pray, and they stayed there for about a week. And when they came back out again, the uh, epidemic had broken because there were no more cases being transmitted. <laughs> that, that was the conclusion in the book, at least. Did we have a consensus on how long immunization is, is good for it? It did not. It's, a, it's an attenuated virus vaccine. Yeah. So, you know who developed it, Dixon? Tell me. Oh, didn't you tell me? Max Tyler. Max. Rockefeller University. Tyler. In the 30s, and he got a Nobel yeah. Prize for it. Yeah, well, he deserved it. That was a great vaccine. It's, it's, it was made by passing yeah. uh, uh, yellow Zero. fever virus in mice. That's right. Was it mice? Wait a minute. I think it was uh-huh. chicken cell cultures. Let's look it up. We don't want to get any emails. <laughs> Hate mail. <laughs> it was passaged many, many times. Um now, I think, for some reason, I think chicken is yep. the one. Mm. Okay, so. Here, here. And, oh, you and got it, fact, Kathy. Uh, right. I have the okay. MMWR uh, report that Start. in <laughs> February 2016, 2015, the American Committee on Immunization Practices voted that a single primary dose of yellow fever vaccine provides long-lasting protection and is adequate for most travelers. This is, I've got something from the National Health Service in the UK saying yellow fever vaccine provides lifelong protection for most people. Booster doses and new vaccination yeah. certificates used used to be recommended every 10 years right. uh, for people who continue to be at risk of infection, but this is no longer necessary in most cases. So I know when I got mine, I got mine in 1984. Mm-hmm. So that's you the year think- I went to um, Africa. So if you think you might be traveling to the tropics at some time in your life, then by age 59, you ought to get this, I guess. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right. So, he, know, so, so how was it made? There was, Vincent, there was, was just recently, there was just recently a, um, a production glitch with I yellow fever vaccine. Hmm. Um, the uh, equipment that Sanofi uses to produce their vaccine in the U.S. apparently broke down and they ran out. And so they got a special approval from the CDC to sell the European yellow fever vaccine in the U.S. until they get their new system set up. Is that the same strain? Uh, is that the same vaccine? I think it may be a different, it's a different vaccine. It's, um, hmm. is that the, so, well, that's why they had to get the special approval. Hmm. Um, Are you surprised that something that was uh, developed in 1930 is still valid in terms of the same strain? No, there's some viruses no. don't, you're thinking about viral variation. Yeah, sure. Polio, we've been using the same vaccine. You're not surprised. No. Smallpox. All right, here's how it was made. Passage in chicken embryos. Chicken embryos. But he assayed virulence in mice, intracerebral inoculation. Hmm. Hun- over 100 uh, passages, Goodness. he developed this attenuated strain called 17D. Wow. And then that was uh, licensed. Hmm. There you go. And so... Was that the first attenuated virus vaccine ever? I believe it was. In humans, as far as I know, I don't okay. want to say anything. Is, is distemper a virus that's attenuated also? Canine distemper yeah. is, that, is a paramyxovirus. Is that attenuated? Come on, Rich, you should know this. <laughs> uh, I do not know. Okay. Let's see. We'll look it up because we have, oh, look at this, only $130 <laughs> from Valley Vet <laughs> Surprise. On eBay? <laughs> eBay. <laughs> it's a dog vaccine. It, it is. Okay. <laughs> so... It was developed at Cornell University, by the way. Uh, yes, that's fact. That's why Baker Institute. Yes, that's right. Exactly, and that's why um, they're well funded. I was going to say <laughs> they're still making money. In on fact, that. the the episode with Colin Parrish, they talked about that. Ah, uh-huh. um, so live attendance. Uh, mod- no- Nobivac, at least the one that I found label information on so far, is a modified live virus vaccine. Live. Okay, well. But it's a parvovirus. It's not a par. It's not a paramyxo, as oh, I said. Right. Okay, par. par. I, I take it back, Rich. <laughs> the canine distemper. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still confused here. Hmm. Canine distemper vaccine. This is a contagious disease, blah, blah, blah. Vaccine. Wait, canine distemper virus. Wait, this. Yeah, it, it's listing it separately from There's par- par- So what kind of virus is it? I think oh. you're right. I think it's a parvovirus. Canine distemper is a viral disease. Thank you. We know that. <laughs> Which virus? Oh, we. Oh, it's a paramyxovirus. Yes. Okay. Canine distemper the- virus is a paramyxovirus, but paramyx- pa- parvos also cause illness in dogs. Yes, Kathy. The and the paramyxoviruses were recently split 
uh, Richard Plemper talked about that at the beginning of his satellite talk. And I can't remember where the split was, but there's a okay. there's a reclassification. So, so this this canine distemper is actually a combination vaccine. Yeah, it has right. canine distemper virus, hepatitis virus, canine adenovirus, parvovirus, and parainfluenza. Wow. Yeah, that threw me when you were saying parvovirus. I saw that, and then I saw adenovirus, and I saw okay. Wait. <laughs> Plus, there are coronaviruses, leptospirosis, and bordetella that can also cause this, and you might find some vaccines with those. Okay. As well. Which are bacteria at the end, of course. Yes, not not here. Yes. Right. Okay. Gee whiz. <laughs> Goodness. The stuff you learn on Twiv. Yes. <laughs> we learn. The stuff you learn by recording. Twiv. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Imagine an everyday, inexpensive drone you could can buy online. Modified by terrorists to spread chemical or biological weapons over a crowded football stadium or holiday parade. Plague VX Sarin weaponized influenza. How would we treat the victims? What could we do to counter the effects? How could we prevent a scenario like this from happening? Join us in Long Beach, California, November 28th through 30th for the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Collaborate with more than 1,500 scientists, subject matter experts, military service members, industry partners, and academic leaders from across the globe who are committed to making the world safer by confronting chem biodefense challenges. Part of the U.S. Department of Defense and charged with safeguarding our warfighters and our nation, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts this important conference and brings together the best and brightest from around the world. They would like you to join them and share your important ideas at this meeting. For more information and to register, go to cbdstconference.com. That's all one word. And you can stay up to date with what is going on with the meeting on Facebook. Look for D-O-D-D-T-R-A, D-O-D-D-T-R-A. We're on Twitter, CBDST conference, one word on Twitter. The 2017 CBD S&T conference, today's innovation, tomorrow's warfighter capabilities. We thank them for their support of TWIV. Now, it just so happens that our paper is also on a Flavy virus, which is totally coincidental and no plan involved. Really, I'm serious. I know I don't sound serious. I don't sound sincere, I should say, <laughs> but I am. I had picked the snippet and then I had had this paper for a couple of weeks I was looking at. PLOS Pathogens, research article. Dengue subgenomic flaviviral RNA disrupts immunity in mosquito salivary glands to increase virus transmission. This comes out of uh, the Duke Singapore School of Medicine uh, CNRS in Montpellier, France, and the University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston. First author is Julien Pompon, and the last author is Mariano Garcia Blanco. And this is all about mosquitoes. I like papers that work with mosquitoes. I do too. I um, you see that more and more, and it, you know, it's it, it's not easy to do, but many no. many people are are developing the technology and, and so forth. So it's quite interesting when when you do this. This is about dengue virus, which is also a flavy virus like yellow fever virus and Zika virus and West Nile Dixon is mouthing. That's right. And, many, and according many. to the paper, dengue viruses are the most important arboviruses in the world. <laughs> now, now, Alan, what would, I'm sure that won't ruffle any feathers. What would, what would uh, d- dictate importance? How many people are in fear? They, uh, apparently, they've decided the criterion is the number of people. And what that, would that be? That are infected. Uh, 390 million. A year. That's a lot. Yeah, it's, that is a lot. And many of them will it's develop serious. The size dengue. of the United States population. Yes. All right. And the, the thing is, if you were then infected with a different serotype, you can have very serious disease as well. So, you bet. But that, I would say that is more people infected than with Zika virus, right? Oh, absolutely. However, Zika does cause birth defects, which is 
not done by dengue. So that's right. hence the interest. And in it Zika. doesn't come anywhere near the number of people infected with malaria. But that's another. How story. many people are infected with malaria? Well, it averages around one and a half to two billion. Billion. Well, billion. Billion. No, how can that be, Dixon? Billion. Let me look it up. I'm not kidding. <laughs> malaria. I just lectured on it. Come on, <laughs> you don't believe a word I said. <laughs> I do believe you, but sometimes you get your digits wrong. I got all my. St- I beg your pardon. <laughs> Look, in the U.S., there are fewer than twenty thousand cases. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, well, yeah, in the count. U.S., and that's true for dengue, also. By the way, <laughs> no, on a statistical basis, it's over two billion people. A year. I believe you. I'll let. In, I'll let our and some listeners. like four billion people are in the zone for transmission. Uh, according to the WHO. Do- the 2015, there were 212 million malaria cases. It's absurd. And 429,000 malaria deaths. Yeah, well. So you don't believe that, Dick? I must tell you. Well, I had a friend, Jim Jensen, who who spent a lot of time in Africa, and he wrote the forward to our uh, fifth edition to our parasitic disease book, and he says every year the entire country of Nigeria gets infected. Hmm. That's over 75 million people. And that isn't even recorded. People just don't even record it because most of those people are immune. And they don't get very sick, and they don't get to a hospital. But he says almost everybody gets infected during that time. So, Dixon, I the WHO does say that nearly half the world's population is at risk of malaria. Yeah, that's yes. uh, that's that's true too. But uh, if you talk to real malaria experts, they say that about half of the cases are not reported. Are there fake malaria experts? Not fake. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, these are. Experts. You said real malaria. Experts. Well, yes. Yeah, so, well, the people who work with malaria, let's put it this way, and go out right. into the field, they'll okay. they'll tell you that most of the cases Dixon, are not reported. You're the parasitologist. Yeah. Yes, I believe. So you. I listen. Yeah, to that. I, I mean, I, I'm not making I this up. Certainly, I'm, I'm I would certainly believe that this is underreported because yeah, I'm is, giving them their story. Yeah. story. But with dengue, when you get sick, you go to a hospital, mm-hmm. and then they get counted. If you want to hear uh, the description of a dengue infection yeah. you go listen to twiv with nina martin you remember she was right. sitting yes. right yes. here oh yeah she, she sure. acquired dengue and that's right. t- right. told us all this and the thing is she still has issues right yeah, yeah. right you know no you're right pain joint pain and so yeah. forth i used to be in charge of our medical elective in the tropics for the fourth year students here and i can recall at least five students coming back with dengue and two of them ended up at the hospital mm-hmm. and they were really worried about them well, it's a very important arbovirus infection. It's the most important. <laughs> <laughs> the most important. It's transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Indeed, it is. So, so let's what what's in this paper and why do we care? Let's let's. Oh, we have to, we have to do that. Uh, yes, we have to do that. Uh, executive right. summary. We keep, ne- we keep neglecting to do that. That's right. This paper addresses a, a feature of the virus that apparently uh, controls its ability to replicating the salivary gland of mosquitoes right. and that's important for transmission right. right and they 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 define this property called epidemiological fitness huh. ef which they say is the capacity to generate an epidemic okay hmm. so they want to know what contributes to this and there are many factors of course uh, remember the, the mosquito takes a blood meal it will ingest dengue virus along with it It'll infect the midgut. It'll spread to other organs and eventually get to the salivary glands where it will replicate and then come out as the mosquito expectorates, taking another blood meal, right? And then uh, within the mosquito, so within the mosquito, the virus is replicating in contrast to myxoma virus, which is not replicating in those mosquitoes. No. In fact, in that article by Frank Fenner, he said he went through the evidence that there's no replication, and he said, "Thus, we can view." The mosquito as a pin, a flying pin, <laughs> a flying pin, <laughs> a flying pin. That's right. That's right. A flying That's right. pin. I have this view of a pin with wings. <laughs> no, they told them. They now refer to them as flying hypodermic needles. But that's exactly right. And actually, what's what's interesting? Uh, this is an aside, but what's interesting about that that I hadn't appreciated before is that, according to Frank, the viremia, that is the virus in the blood, is not important. What's important is how much virus is in the skin. Right, uh, and in particular, if uh, mm-hmm. if a if a mosquito, and I uh, talked to Grant about this, if the mosquito um, takes a blood meal from one of the lesions on a rabbit, that's going to be a high titer uh, virus. But it's in the skin, not necessarily what's in the blood. That would be tel- uh, telmophagy, as opposed ah, to solenophagy. Look at you! Look at you! So oh. that, I learned this on the last look whip. At you. A telmophagic vector takes blood on the surface, like from lesions. Yeah. 
where solenophagic vectors go into the capillaries. That is cool. So in this case, the myxoma would be a telmophagic vector. Uh, did we also, in but the for, other uh, discussion, discuss whether or not um, flies of various kinds could also do this? You know, like blowflies. You're talking about myxoma? Yeah. Actually, um, Fenner mentioned ticks. Ticks. Don't worry, folks. We'll get back to dengue in a moment. Right. <laughs> That's right. So well, we can get back. We can get back. We can get back right now because one of the reasons that I care about this is that uh, the uh, uh, okay. So Vincent has done that. Uh, this Why virus do you care? Why replicates. Do you care? Uh, I care because the mechanism is crazy. Yeah, it's a cool mechanism. Yes. The why, mechanism. Why don't, we just, why don't we just say it and move on? <laughs> Instead of going into the details. Well, I would like to know the details because uh, that's why I care. The last thing you need to know is that when mosquitoes get infected, they make immune responses. They make right. innate immune responses, including RNAi. Remember? RNA-based interference. Because this is not a vertebrate, right? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have antiviral RNAi, plants and insects. And an important virus component that can modulate, that's known to modulate uh, innate responses is what is called the subgenomic flaviviral RNA fragment, what? SFRNA, which you asked me about yesterday, Dixon. I did. And these were discovered quite a while ago. They're very interesting. So the flavi genome is an RNA, plus-stranded RNA. It has a three-prime non-coding region, which has a variety of stem loop structures in it. It turns out that there is a host exonuclease, exo meaning the enzyme digests nucleic acid from the ends, as opposed to endo, which would be from interior. Yes. It's called XRN1, and it it digests the three-prime end of dengue virus RNA, but it gets stuck no, at the No, five-prime. Five-prime. Three-prime UTR. Three-prime UTR. It's a five-prime exonuclease. I, I looked that up because I was annoyed at the authors for not so saying that. In this corner, I, I mean, the, the structures, Spindler. <laughs> structures in the RNA genome, though, are in the three-prime UT. Correct. Yes. So this thing starts from the five-prime end and okay, does 90% of, of the, the genome. <laughs> right, it just right. stops. 90% right. of the genome and then gets hung up and leaves a bit of the three-prime end. Isn't that And then it, it stalls at various stem loops, and there are different ones in the three-prime end, so you can have different little bits of RNA left which have been shown by others to suppress RNAi and other amazing. innate responses. Amazing. So they're determinants of pathogenesis. That's been shown in animal models for different flavies, including um, West oh, Nile. Ain't nature grand. It's very cool. And um, yeah. so this, I don't think we've ever talked about these subgenomic RNAs before. So this exonuclease, it, it is, uh, its job is to degrade <laughs> RNAs that shouldn't be around or turnover RNAs that you want to get rid of, right? So this is a normal function for this enzyme. Yeah, it, it, this is one of the major uh, messenger RNA degradation enzymes. This is this gets rid of the message after after you're done with it. Right. So they do kill the messenger then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so okay. they, they're going to look at this in terms of um, a series of dengue isolates from Puerto Rico, big outbreak 1994 to 95, which they believe... And others too that the sequence of the three prime UTR was important, mm. uh, and that changed, and they think that somehow um, SF, what is it, F S SF uh, RNAs were important. So they have this whole collection of Puerto Rican isolates, and they're going to look in mosquitoes to see if some of these three prime UTR sequences are important or not. So apparently, in this 1994 epidemic there was a shift in epidemiological fitness uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in the virus going from, so they have a collection of viruses that I presume would be from earlier in the epidemic. There's one, two, three, four, five, six of them uh, that they describe as having low epidemiological fitness. And then there's a cluster of uh, a total of four viruses th uh, from, I would presume, later in the epidemic, three of which have higher epidemiological fitness and one sort of maverick, uh, although it, uh, I guess, has a genomic signature. It's, it's related to these other uh, viruses of high epidemiological fitness that evolved. It, nevertheless, has low epidemiological fitness. Right? Right. And they want to compare these, focusing on the three prime end, for the uh, this SFRNA and see if they can 
pin this change in epidemiological fitness on the SFRNA. So this is amazing. I want to, I want to get this thought out before I lose it. <laughs> so you lose the genome, right? You the exonuclease chews it up, and you're left with these little things at the end, little pieces Dangles. that help whoever's left. Right. They're like saying, screw you. <laughs> you, ch- you digested us, but I'm helping <laughs> the other virus. I mean, just think of the evolutionary selection for that, right? This well, I was, is- thinking about, I was thinking about this because probably – uh, this uh, immunosuppressive effect of the three prime end evolved in the whole genome, as you know. Uh, but this maybe uh, maybe it uh, could have though. Uh, yeah, it, it could have. That's actually um, a good. I don't know if anyone's done that to take, you know, the entire RNA and see if it will do the the things that it's known to do to the innate response. Right? Well, that yeah, that's interesting. Um, it may have been done, but I'm not aware of it. Yeah. So I'm I'm always um, thinking about the primary host, the definitive host, and the intermediate host. When I think about parasites, when you start applying that kind of thinking to viral infections, what is the definitive host for the dengue virus? Is it the mosquito or is it the mammalian host? And, you know, for malaria, it's absolutely clear that the mosquito is the definitive host because that's where the sexual stages occur. Is it, and that's that, how it's defined. That's but, how it's defined, but right? By, but well, we don't viruses, have viruses. Yeah. These are promiscuous. They affect all kinds of vertebrates and invertebrates, cold and warm blooded. Do we use definitive host in terms of viruses? I don't know. Not that I'm aware of. Dixon is trying to. I'm just trying to put this in context of evolutionary history because before there were mammals, there were mosquitoes. Sure. Well, well and and, <laughs> and you know, it's hard to. I mean. Uh, depending on your perspective, viruses either don't have sex or they have it all the time. Okay. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, right. Exactly right. <laughs> well, there you go. That's right. So That's right. that makes it hard to define a definitive host because they have, they, like I said, either they don't have sex or they have it everywhere. Okay? Well, we just we just grow up the virus so that the, the mosquito can become infected again. So the, the problem is, Dixon, that with that terminology is that yeah. without mammals, the, the mosquitoes couldn't spread viruses to one another. No, but right? there, there was another animal that took the place of the mammal, like, for instance, uh, dinosaurs or reptiles. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but if there were no hosts for the mosquitoes, could they spread it to each other via plants, the drinking ah. sap, right? Or or does it vertically transmit? And it doesn't. Dengue does not vertically transmit no. in mosquitoes. Some, some do, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And dengue doesn't have any non-mammalian hosts, does it? Uh, no. Not aware of any, no. But certainly the mosquitoes can get dengue virus from primates in forests, right? Right. Uh, yeah, in, but rarely. Though. I think that's a rare deal. I think mostly it's people. They are maintaining the reservoir of dengue mostly on the planet? People. Yeah. Mostly it's people. If you look it up, I mean, yellow fever is in monkeys and people, but I think dengue virus is largely in people. No, there is a sylvatic cycle for dengue. Maybe it's rare, but there certainly is one. Okay. And we've we've talked about that before. All right, anyway, in this paper, they're looking at these Puerto Rican, select Puerto Rican isolates. Yep. And I think they have some before and after these changes that are associated with the increased epidemiological fitness. All right, and they look in mosquitoes. Yes, Dixon. I, I just, you know, the light bulb went on when we started to think about this in terms of epidemiology also. Look what's happening right now in the Caribbean. You've got this gigantic whirling mass of Mm -hmm. wind that's going to pick up things from Puerto Rico and deposit them into Florida. So will mosquitoes survive this wind? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the eggs too. I mean, you can transport all the, all the stages of this mosquito from one place to another. In fact, that's how Bangladesh first acquired dengue from India via a cyclone. Cyclone, Yeah, Yeah, it was. So So, this could happen again. But are there any are there any vector borne viruses transmitting in Puerto Rico that weren't already being repeatedly introduced into Florida? Hmm. Well, <laughs> you have to have the re- yeah. you have to have the proper mosquito, and that's the point. That's why Zika succeeded in Miami, but not in northern Florida because the mosquito didn't get that far north. Right, but if you introduce the mosquito with a hurricane, it's not going to change its ability to survive in areas further north. No, but it. it I think if you introduced it, it would survive. Really? Yeah, because the control programs for for tree hole breeding mosquitoes is is pretty effective in most uh, urban communities and peri uh, domestic 
uh, places. So you think you think Florida has actually, through human intervention, has maintained an absolute wall on the northern spread of these mosquitoes? Maybe it's the agricultural initiative. Maybe it's yeah, it, it's possible. Wow, it's possible. So they have isolates of low epidemiological fitness and high, right? Right. You no, know, four or five of each one. And they're going to look at these in mosquitoes. So they give me- mosquitoes blood meals with these viruses in them. And then they ask what's going on. And they look at what they call feeding rate, mosquito survival, virus infectivity. It's not really a rate, right, Kathy? (laughs) Right. They talk about an infection rate, but really it's a proportion of tissue that's infected over the total number of mosquito tissues. So it's a percentage rather than a rate. And they don't see any difference. The two sets of viruses, no differences really in those parameters. Okay. Mm. Um, Level of viral genomes. Pretty much the same across all, which is really an interesting. We'll get back to that at the end, I hope. Mm-hmm. No difference in viral genomic uh, RNA quantified by uh, re- RT-PCR. Then they look at the, the amount of subgenomic flavy viral RNA, those little bits from the three prime end. Mm-hmm. All right. And there they see the ratio of the subgenomic RNA to the full genome is much higher in the high EF isolates than those with low EF. Everybody okay with that? Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Looks That looks pretty good. Um, and in, they, they so that's in mosquitoes. They infect some human hept- uh, liver cells, HUH7. They find the same thing. Correlation between um, the, the high EF isolates have a higher ratio of the subgenomic to the full genome. And now they look in the salivary gland of these mosquitoes. Okay, because that's where the the virus has to come from in order for it to be transmitted. And um, they find that in the salivary glands, um, first of all, the ratio of subgenomic to genomic is higher in the salivary glands than in the midgut and carcass for any of these viruses, which is interesting. And secondly, the ratio is higher in the salivary glands for those viruses with high epidemiological fitness compared to low epidemiological fitness viruses. So the suggestion is that this, these little RNAs are somehow playing a role in, in, uh, in that. And there's no difference in the exonuclease uh, expression, mRNA expression in the salivary glands. So that, and by the way, uh, this is uh, a detail, but by the time they get just a little bit into this paper, they decide to focus on just two viruses. Yeah. Uh, and and what they choose to focus on are the this one outlier in the evolved group that it does has a low epidemiological fitness, and compare that to uh, its buddies that have the high epidemiological fitness. Mm. Um, I would. I'd like to see an expansion of this study that would uh, do the same sort of thing, comparing the uh, earlier, presumed earlier viruses that have low epidemiological fitness. But I suppose there's probably more differences. It's a more difficult study to do. And uh, at any rate, they're they're comparing two fairly closely related viruses from the uh, evolved uh, clade. Uh, right. uh, mm-hmm. One with high and one with low epidemiological fitness. Right. Now, at this point, they want to zoom in on the sequences. And so they they actually have a pair um, of high and low EF viruses that only have differences in the three prime UTR. Actually, they've got differences elsewhere in the genome, but there's only two differences in the three prime UTR. So oh, they so they make, a, yeah, they make an them. isogenic strain. Right. Right. That then will have only those three prime differences. They made I did not. Rec- I did not recognize what virus it is that they're using as background for this. Uh, so they use a they they use some other dengue virus uh, that they uh, tag tack on the two different three prime ends to. Right. Yeah. Based on the this dengue two NGC isolate. So once you've made those, then yes, indeed, you'd have t- uh, two viruses that differ only in two nucleotides in the three prime. End. Right. And they give those new names, which further confuse you. <laughs> if you're trying to keep track of them. <laughs> yeah, because they only have the letters IC and the same mm-hmm. long numbers after them. Right. So there's the IC viruses and the PR viruses, the original Puerto Rico viruses 
and then IC, and we don't exactly know what IC stands for. Hmm. Integrated circuit. Or something <laughs> chimeric. Yeah. Introduce, uh, whatever. Well, basically what they find is that the three prime UT are from the high EF strain uh, in this in these chimeric viruses is responsible for the higher ratio of subgenomic to genomic RNA uh, in mosquito salivary glands. So it's a three prime UTR that's responsible uh, for this for this phenotype, and that three prime UTR also leads to higher uh, virus production in the salivary gland. And here, uh, they uh, they they. Determine virus production by tittering virus. <laughs> Did you know that was an assay? Even if it were titering, it wouldn't be right, of True. course. We've mentioned that before, yep. titrating. But the 3' prime UTR mediates higher virus production as well as more of this subgenomic RNA. Mm. Um, and, then, and again, higher infection rate of saliva. It's not really a rate. It's just the higher percentage of salivas that are positive, right? And um, then they go on to show that this 3' prime UTR, again, associated with high EF, uh, is disrupting innate immune pathways uh, in the salivary gland. They measure the expression of genes that are known to be in, involved in sensing and signal transduction involved in innate immune responses. And that high EF 3' prime UTR is associated with uh, disrupting those pathways, um, which is the mechanistic part of of, of the work, of course. You want to know what that 3' prime UTR is doing. Um, and that's essentially it. So you have a 3' prime UTR sequence from this high epidemiological fitness virus from Puerto Rico that is responsible for making higher amounts of this uh, short genomic, subgenomic RNA, and it, makes, it leads to higher virus production, and it's disrupting innate immune responses in the salivary gland. Wow. So that's it's the... It's, 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 Go ahead. Specific to the salivary gland. Specific this seems to, to the tissue, yes. tissue specific. Yes, that's very cool. It's, it's, and why that's so, we don't know. Because there's no difference in the amount of XRN, but there may be other proteins in there that are that are involved as well. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I well, think you were I think you were alluding to uh, before to the notion that uh, in the salivary gland there doesn't seem to be much differences in the amount of genomic RNA, but a difference in right. the amount of infectious virus, which suggests that the effect of this is somewhere in the maybe the morphogenesis pathway or something like that. Yeah, that's what I would guess. So there must be some innate response that is it is it targeting something other than RNA synthesis, right? Mm -hmm. And then now this is alleviating it, right? Yes, Kathy. I was just going to say that um, they point out that they only looked at the RNA levels for the XRN, and they mm -hmm. say there could be differences in protein or activity levels. And also later they talk about the fact that when they dissect the insects, by the time they take out the salivary glands and the midgut, there's not a whole lot left <laughs> that they can actually evidently work with yeah. so that's what they call it what they call it the carcass yeah and and so they say maybe there's other organs where this higher proportion of the subgenomic flavivirus rna is present but they can't assay that did you look at the methods for how they collect sub saliva uh from uh, uh <laughs> they say from from a blood meal okay they they're pretty particular about this last experiment where they want to look at mm -hmm. the amount of virus and the infection rate in saliva uh, to make sure that they get salivating um, mosquitoes. They have them take a blood meal and then assay the blood. Right. Did, you, did you look at that? I did. They got the blood in a 10 microliter pipette tip right and they take the wings and the legs off of the mosquitoes they take mosquitoes that they know have already fed some because they've got blood in their abdomen that's important okay then they take the wings and the legs off them and stick their proboscis into the tip of this pipette into the blood did i get this right that's right and leave mm -hmm. them there leave them there for 30 Five seconds yep. and i guess they got to do the they got to 30 minutes them like 30 minutes. They got to dissect them like that to immobilize them, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, and lest up. anybody be worried, they are cold anesthetized mosquitoes. Cold anesthetized. Yes. 
I yeah. don't care what you do to a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very badly. You do, eh? No, not that badly. Uh, um, it's a common procedure, though, yeah. to take yeah. off all that stuff. And, um, and then they extract they, the RNA from the blood, so you know the saliva went into the blood, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. They imply, uh, in terms of mechanism, that the sfRNA is binding to some of the proteins involved in the immune response directly. But they don't seem to have any direct evidence for exactly what the sfRNA is doing. They think it's probably binding some of the molecules that are doing the signaling in the immune response. Right. So this this change in the three prime UT are these changes? They're not sure. I think there are two or three differences in the. Three there were two in these guys. And they don't know. Uh, they don't know which one is responsible, right? No, they don't. These arose during this 1994-95 outbreak in Puerto Rico, and they apparently predominated in the outbreak. So, you know, based on this work, you could say that these changes may have contributed to that, but you can't prove it, of course, and there are likely to be other factors as well. One one thing I'd be interested in knowing is if this is such an important or advantageous change for the virus, did it spread globally and replace all other sequences, right? Or is right. there a fitness cost associated with it and so forth? I don't know the answers to that, but someone might know. Good question. They- they do speculate as to which of the two mutations might be more responsible, and they point to the one that's in that uh, XRRNA uh, stem loop structure as opposed to the one yeah. that's upstream near the stop codon. Yeah, they have apparently recently s- solved the structure of, of one of these uh, RNAs. It's a, it a recent science paper. Zika, I think. And it's... Um, it's it's it forms a pseudonaut, and so they're yeah. speculating based on that structure which of these might be a pseudonaut. Dixon looks yes. like a knot, but it's not. Well, I, I assume <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I'm fooling you? I'm afraid not. It's not we, not. We could go on anyway. Who's so I, it's cool because this, this subgenomic <laughs> RNA is very interesting. How it is generated and its effect on the innate response and viral replication. This is cool that it has a specific effect in salivary glands as well. So it's nice, nice biology. So, so you said that these two uh, changes in the three prime end evolved during this uh, particular epidemic, and uh, there's a subtlety here that uh, I want to take some issue with because mm-hmm. those two nucleotide changes are just in that one strain that amongst the what I'm calling the evolved viruses has the low epidemiologic fitness. Okay, it's not like those two changes are in all of those strains. This is why I'd like to. Okay. So this is a yeah. bit of weirdness. Okay. Do you mean high? Uh, do you mean high fitness? Um, okay. So there was this epidemic, right? Right. And you got several strains that are low epidemiologic fitness, and then several that evolved out of that uh, that have high epidemiologic fitness, and a virus that's kind of in that clade that has nevertheless low epidemiologic fitness okay right. so it's mm-hmm. an outlier okay right. and right, it's, right. it's though it's that guy's three prime end that they're comparing with the other and that guy's three prime end has these two new nucleotides okay none of none of the other uh so that's it's as if those change it's as if there was this evolution to high uh epidemiologic fitness and then in that virus these two other changes came along Okay, that gave it a low epidemiology. Mm, okay, because those two changes aren't in any of these other viruses. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. why I would like to see them. And there's a whole bunch of other. If you in this supplementary figure one, mm-hmm. uh, there are uh, a whole bunch of other differences between the group of low early, what I'm calling early in the epidemic, low epidemiologic fitness viruses, and the later ones. And I'd like to see a comparison of those three prime ends mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and see if you can pin the the difference in epidemiologic fitness on on those in the three prime end as well. As a matter of fact, there's another – there's a creature in here that's compl- – that has – I guess this is one of the high epidemiologic fitness ones that has a three prime end that looks totally different yeah. than, than all the others. So maybe so. there was a fitness cost – imposed by these mutations which supposedly gave it a higher epidemiological fitness and then this one began to emerge right could be and that could have 
spread and predominated, but maybe that was the end of the epidemic. Who knows? So it'd be nice to, as I said, it'd be nice to take one of these evolved ones and compare it to one of the earlier ones. Okay. So that's show the same thing. That's why I think you can't explain that outbreak solely by these three prime UTR changes. Just Mm -hmm. cannot. It might sound nice that you know they lead to increased viral replication in the salivary glands, but I think there are other issues that. Play. Well, the the important thing is that by focusing in on this one, they were able to demonstrate that you can see an effect of that three prime end on immune suppression in the mosquito in right. a fashion that right. is consistent with the change in epidemiologic fitness. So that's fine. Right. So I think it would be nice to look at circulating strains and see what they have in the three prime mm-hmm. DR, right? Do they have a sequence that is antagonistic or not? Be cool to do. Right, Dixon? Right. Anyway, that's a cool study. I like it, mechanistically. Stay tuned. Anything else? Are we okay? We're good. Moving forward? Have, yep. have, have these uh, increases in uh, epidemiological fitness been seen in other outbreaks of dengue? Because it occurs all over the world. No, no. That's what I asked, yeah. Okay. So uh, I asked that. I would I'm like sorry. to know. I do not know the answer. I'm sorry. Uh, we could call Tyler and ask him. Yeah, Tyler, tell us. Yeah. He's uh, dealing with uh, a, hurricane. a hurricane. He's in PR, uh, right? He's in PR. Yeah. You, you may he's not know. Okay. We Still. may not be able to call him. <laughs> he's, he, uh, he's probably will he's not okay. listen. He probably will not listen for many years. I've been following. <laughs> I, I've been following him on Facebook. As a matter of fact, I ought to uh, tell him that this is uh, happening. It was a glancing and, uh, blow to. Uh, it was a glancing blow. They got oh, okay. uh, a lot of wind and, and rain. Light. But that's right. They got off easy. Okay. Let's do some email. Dixon, can you take that first I, one? I would be happy to. Paul writes to the Twivley Gardens. <laughs> Thanks, as always, for the spectacularly informative content. And then he lists in a spectacularly informative content. Explicit organ donation opt-out laws have long been among the major interventions in countries such as Austria, Belgium, and the Czech Republic, Finland, France, Greece, Hungary, Israel, Italy, Luxembourg, Norway, Poland, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, and Turkey. Countries with opt-out laws have- Also known pretty much as Europe. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there are very few- ex- uh, Okay. Countries with opt-out laws have rates 25 to 30% higher than those in countries requiring explicit consent. However, presumed consent appears to be only one of several influential factors. However, the Spanish organization credited with bringing that country to a world record organ donation rate of over 40 donors per million, 50% above the U.S. rate and nearly double that the over the average EU rate, attribute most of their success to a complex of personnel policies and procedures within the tertiary care infrastructure, not opt out, and gives a reference for that as well. On the role of Spain's Spain's transplantation laws, which presumes consent unless otherwise stated, Dr. Rafael Matasens is dismissive. What we have brought to this area is organization. Following a philosophy that states that donors do not simply fall from the heavens, we have provided organizational and professionalism. More importantly, these life-saving efforts still leave us far behind the need for life-saving organs. The U.S. organ donation list for life-saving transplants runs about 117,000 and in quotes 360 people per million population. UNSO data, and that's derived from the UNSO data, the the list grows to about 140 people per day. About 95 transplants are performed while every uh, day 20 people per day on that list die without a transplant. The need for life-saving organs will outstrip supply under any and all conditions. Sign up to be a soup a donor. <clears throat> Save up to eight lives with your decision, but do not stop pursuit of artificial and allograft technologies to save even more lives. 18 or rainy centigrade degrees in Philadelphia, not the nicest day of summer. Thank you. Good points. Mm-hmm. Excellent <clears throat> points. Recently, uh, Ben Tenuver, who is Virus Ninja on Twitter, tweeted, Recent papers showing lack of evidence for RNAi in mammals relevant to TWIV450, which of course was an episode on which he was a guest and talked about his work in this area. And we have one paper from Scientific Reports called The Evolution of Animal Argonauts, Evidence for the Absence of Antiviral 
ego, argonauts, invertebrates. Now I'm confused. Evidence of absence, absence of evidence. <laughs> it's a double <laughs> negative. <laughs> what they have found here, they've done a phylogenetic comparison of sequences of argonauts, which is the enzyme that's part of the RNA-induced silencing complex that chews up the target you know, in response to a, a small RNA. They say that vertebrates lack siRNA class agoproteins and display low rates of molecular evolution, which is not good evidence that there's a virus there, virus-based mechanism or a virus interfering mechanism, because if there were, it would be more rapidly accelerated. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And the other one is M-sphere. Deletion of cytoplasmic double-stranded RNA sensors does not uncover viral small interfering RNA production in human cells. So they deleted uh, from cells the, the genes encoding the RNA sensors, the cytoplasmic RNA sensors, Rig I and MDA5. We did not detect 22 nucleotide viral siRNAs upon infection with three different plus-strand RNA viruses. Our data suggests that the depletion of cytoplasmic Rig I-like sensors is not sufficient to uncover viral siRNAs in differentiated cells. So the argument here is that people have been saying that uh, you know, RNA sensing hides any potential, um, the, the, the interferon response hides any potential RNAi base. So they took it away here and you still don't see it. So that's two uh, little bits of evidence. Thank you for that. Yeah, Five Ben was, ben was uh, talked about how this is a very controversial topic, whether or not uh, vertebrates, uh, mammals, have an RNAi pathway. And so this is ongoing we've done a couple of papers we've done a couple of papers that suggest they do and these are papers that suggest they don't do you uh, were you on that uh, episode with ben with uh, ben yeah it yeah. was a great episode was i really enjoyed that yep. last email kathy paul writes dear twivians thank you as always for the wonderful twiv podcast that i listen to on my way to and from work informative and fun just like the old tea room discussions that I remember from my earlier postdoc and junior faculty days. They don't happen as much anymore, as everyone now seems almost permanently hunched over either their benches or computers. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to add to comments Vincent made about his encounter with shingles. Like you, I didn't get the old man vaccine, but got classic shingles instead a few years ago. A vesicular rash spread across my back following the relevant dermatome. But unlike you, I did something about it. I got my wife to photograph the vesicular spread, mm. and I've shown that picture to my med students in subsequent classes when we talk about herpes viruses. No better exemplar than a personal <laughs> one. There must have been something about that year because I also got an eye infection that was clearly not bacterial. I went to my general practitioner who diagnosed a very likely viral infection but wasn't sure which one. I was reassured that there was not much that could be done and it would resolve. But when I got back to the lab... I swabbed it and mm. sequenced it. Nice. When I went back to the general practitioner for a follow-up visit, I was <laughs> able to advise him that it was an adenovirus 5 infection. <laughs> Guess what? I got my wife to photograph that as well. Okay. And it features in my pathogenesis of viral infections lecture to the <laughs> medicos. I have to say, I do limit my personal demonstrations to naturally acquired infections. <laughs> <laughs> we have just hit spring in Brisbane, and it's going to be fine and 32 degrees centigrade Celsius today. Definitely short sleeves, finally. Cheers, Paul. Mm. Um, and so he sent it in a picture, and as I wrote in the show notes, as I was just scrolling down to look at the pics of the week, I saw this eye, and I said, adenovirus infection, without <laughs> even reading <laughs> Nice. The so, so, Kathy, how would he have acquired this eye infection? I, uh, you know, adenovirus is pretty stable in the environment. It's non-enveloped. Uh, from however out. you yeah well you yeah. so i mean one way you can is in improperly sanitized pools or hot tubs things like uh, that right contact right. lenses contact lenses Maybe. so paul please speculate in your next email on how you acquired <laughs> yeah. this infection that's right yeah is it i'm, thinking, I'm thinking uh uh handrail in a public place yeah i, I was just mm. going to suggest yeah you know, and then rub your eyes and then rub, rub your, your eyes exactly right yeah. is that two letters from brisbane was the uh, could be yeah? This Paul sent two today. Yeah, 
Oh, Paul, that was the that was also Paul. Yeah, okay. Well, mm-hmm. Paul, you can't write too much. We we're happy that you're engaged. <laughs> and two uh, t- uh, two years ago, driving back across the country from our cross country trip, I had exactly this infection. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Should have, it was, it should it have was taken, really great. You should have swapped should have it. taken a picture. Take yeah. a picture, yeah. Yeah. I, I, so the funny thing is my shingles came at the very beginning of TWIV. It was like episode eight. And I didn't think, if it were today, I would photograph it mm. for sure. Okay. Now, Paul Young, uh, who writes frequently, was on a TWIV from Australia when I, when I visited. Um, talked about um, dengue, I believe, or... Uh, the, the koala retrovirus. He works on both in his laboratory. Let's do some picks of the week. You betcha. Dixon, do you have a pick <laughs> for us? Boy, do I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is sort of self-serving. You, you said that a few times about some of your picks. And I'll it's okay. Certainly you, you say that yourself. about this one because uh, I've had the uh, recent pleasure of visiting um, South Africa, and I I treated myself to a new lens for my high-end camera, which I have still yet to learn to fully use. But the lens has an autofocus uh, feature to it and and a stabilization uh, feature to it also. So the images come out fairly in focus if you stick to those two regimens. And and so I asked uh, Vincent to help me improve my uh, photo art website by adding those pictures to it. So I recommend to you going to my photo website called Depommier Photo Art dot com and um, seeing for yourself whether I was justified in putting them on or not. Uh, uh, absolutely, Dixon. These are gorgeous. I had a lot of fun These taking just them. Just beautiful. And I'm They're glad so you beautiful. glad you like them. What's the gallery are the newest ones in? Uh, and a lot of them. The the gallery one, for instance, has uh, landscapes and animals oh, and I see. plants, and there's a lot of new pictures. So the new ones are all at the bottom of the yeah. The, we put them That's at right. last. That's right. Yeah. So I got, got one that I was really happy with which was the yawning leopard. And you can actually do a dental examination on this animal. <laughs> it's, it's an absolute perfect focus. And I, I was stunned to see that leopards do not have molars. <laughs> they don't have one tooth that's not involved in, in chewing or mashing. They're all cutting teeth, every one of them. And um, it's quite intimidating to see a leopard right next to the car you're sitting in open its mouth that Oh, wide. I see this one. It's, it is amazing. <laughs> it was a lucky shot, but it was uh, Neat. The, wow. one I, the one I was there. So I've entered a lot of these photographs into the uh, National Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year 2017, cool. not expecting anything to happen. But there's a Facebook um, portion to this, and people either like or don't like things and a lot of people took the portrait of the leopard and said they liked it so that's that's pleasing to know that is really mm-hmm. good anyway nice. self-serving but uh, having well fun. You, what's the gallery software running on this just to yeah good out. question well it's we a, we um it's all code <laughs> we bought a package and i just ah. put it up it's a static website it's not like a wordpress uh, or anything like exactly. that and not a template um, that's right we bought something that was already Stuck. So you have to do the code. I have to work on the code. Vincent is a master at this. I mean, no, I sit no. behind him and I watch him do this, and he says, "Oh, damn! All this, damn this." And I, I said, "Vincent, how do you keep track of all this stuff?" Yeah, and he no. does. He does it, it's and he nothing. does it wonderfully. So I'm deeply appreciative. Thank you, uh, Dixon. You've got a picture here under the landscapes of some yes. cactus on the edge of what looks That's like right. a salt flat or something. It is a like salt that? flat in Bolivia. It's in Bolivia, and it's it's okay. a fantastic place to visit. It's just amazing. That's 75 feet of th- thick of salt floating on top of a lake mm. a super saturated lake do i need a crazy. yellow fever vaccine to go there you don't but don't get stuck out there at night especially during the winter mm-hmm. when the temperature goes from like 60 degrees in the daytime that's fahrenheit to minus 40 degrees fahrenheit Whoa. in wow. at night and a whole bunch of people have died are getting stuck on the cell flat mm-hmm. trying to make it across. Uh, so, Dixon, are you going to go back through these and caption them all for me, please? <laughs> you think? <laughs> I'll call you sometime. We'll talk about it. <laughs> What's this one with the uh, lace wings? Black. Uh, both wings are overlaid on top of each other and it's hanging on a branch. Oh, I think oh, it's one of the oh, more recent you know, ones. No, 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 no. That's an older picture. That's In fact, I took that oh. picture when I first got my, my high-end camera, which is a Canon uh, 5D. This is called a salmon fly but it actually ah. is a stone fly. If you turn it over, it's got the color of the abdomen is the color of salmon meat. So they ah. call them salmon flies. But it's are, a they, very... are they GMO? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm That's trying to beautiful. think of GMO for something other than what it stands for. No, they're they're quite intimidating when you see them, but they have no biting mouth parts, so you can actually pick the, pick them up and 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 how big is that? They're about two and a half inches long. Okay. And trout just love them. Cool. They just love them. Now you put them on a hook. No, but you put an imitation. Oh, you make an imitation. Yeah, one. and you. One of them you can is, save a step by just putting the fly on the hook. <laughs> well, one of them is called. <laughs> one of the imitations is called sofa pillow. So you can imagine how big these flies are that you have to make to to represent you and these the, uh, hatches. You and the guide were chatting about these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's you know, it's a series of jargons that yeah, yeah. people who do. So this. when you tie one of those, do you call it a salmon fly fly? <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> you actually do. <laughs> Well, these are really nice, Dixon. Glad you like They're them. Awesome. Yeah. Glad you like them. Very nice. Yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a weather, science, and aviation link. Uh, this is NOAA's Hurricane Hunters website. Oh, right. These people fly airplanes <gasps> into hurricanes. They're crazies. Yes. They're, um, the, the, the one job in here that looks kind of cool is the folks in the Gulfstream 4 jet. They fly <laughs> over the hurricane. They go up to 45,000 feet and they, yeah. they totally miss it, but they get great aerial shots. <laughs> um, but then the, the folks in the, the P3 Orion, they just go straight through the storm. And that's how they get the data on things like uh, peak winds and internal pressures on storms that are out at sea. Alan, how can you fly into 150 mile an hour wind? No problem. No problem. I can't. Uh, yeah, planes, not in your plane. <laughs> the planes that I fly, that's actually more than the maximum cruising speed. So I would just yeah. get blown off, rip right the wings off. off. So that's these right. these planes yeah, would just, shred you. These planes <laughs> just fly right through it because they're going they fast. They fly. They're they're turboprops. They're probably cruising at 250 or so or plus knots. Um, so the winds, and, the uh, winds do not blow them off course at all. Uh, the winds do blow them off course, but they, they can steer a course that'll still take them through, um, through the hurricane. And it's not. It, it's interesting. I was reading some of their stuff. It turns out that flying through a hurricane is actually uh, a lot less hazardous than flying <laughs> through a thunderstorm. Correct. Because hmm. the winds are horizontal in a hurricane. Mm-hmm. And the big danger in thunderstorms is you get these incredible updrafts and downdrafts that throw the plane all over and rip the wings off and slam you into the ground. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> in the in the hurricane, you've got, yeah, the wind is, you know, 150 miles an hour plus, but it's all blowing at you horizontally or across or a tailwind. Yeah. And so they can actually fly through it. Yeah, so they have a little Q&A here. Why aren't these hurricane hunters torn yep. apart? And it's what they do, yeah. <laughs> Cool. But they have I, to I would imagine that navigating through a hurricane would be a very, pretty tricky business because the, you know, the wind gets uh, heavier and Changes heavier direction. and then all of a sudden, boom, you're in the <laughs> and then all of a sudden, boom, you got it from the other direction. And, right? and they have, they have videos you can watch from the plane as they right. go through these. I mean, the first people to do this, they were nuts. <laughs> right. I, I mean, before anybody knew you could do this, yeah. but, um, but they've got video shots from inside the planes. You can watch as they fly through and they, they get to the eye and it's just eerie because they're in this cloud and it's rain and cloud and rain. And then all of a sudden they're in clear and they're surrounded by this stadium of clouds. It's, it's, it's astounding to see that wall. Yeah. It's, just now, amazing. when you're flying through the the hurricane, it's very bouncy. I presume, right? <laughs> uh, probably, yes. A little bit. Now, Alan, is this what you're training for? No, <laughs> no. I, I, uh, you don't want to I do don't this? think I ever would have followed this particular career line in any way. I missed the exit for that. By, are these like people? Years. Are these people um, Air Force former Air They're, Force pilots? The or? pilots. The pilots are military. Mm. Um, so that's who Noah pulls from to do this. I see. Well trained. Yes. That's very cool. Very neat. It is. Rich, what do you have? I have a book called Awakenings. It's uh, not a recent book. I actually forget what the publication date is, but it's quite a while ago by Oliver Sacks. Yes. Yeah. Uh, This was, you know, my uh, reference person for reading is uh, Grant McFadden. He feeds me, you know, he's just (laughs) a voracious reader. And he feeds me 10 times what I can do. So this is one of his recommendations. One of many books by Oliver Sacks, who was a neurologist. Uh, And um, this is about. He was here, right? At Columbia. Ah, right. Okay. Uh, This is about um, when he was uh, a doctor in a 
uh, hospital. I maybe you remember the name, uh, Dixon. I don't. Uh, uh, in the New York, in the New York area, Montefiore. That, I believe it was. Okay, where they had institutionalized yes. uh, a bunch of different patients who were suffering um, Parkinson's-like uh, symptoms consequent to uh, an infection, uh, a disease called encephalitis lethargica. So apparently there was an epidemic of this disease, which is a kind of sleeping sickness, not the tetsy fly sleeping sickness. It's been called sleeping sickness, but it's, it's, it's different, and the etiology is unknown. But there was an epidemic in this in the early 20th century, 1915 to like 1926, that apparently globally affected like 5 million people. Right. Uh, and was characterized by an early attack of symptoms mm-hmm. that uh, could be a fairly severe sort of catatonia uh, from which or, or something very mild or not even noticeable from which people recovered. And then years later, slowly descended into, once again, a Parkinsonian like uh, condition that uh, had a, a, a large catatonic component to it where they really couldn't these people couldn't do anything and uh most of them became institutionalized or a lot of them became institutionalized and uh this was one of oliver sack's uh, first investigations having uh gotten his training as a, a neurologist and he recorded these and uh, and published them in this book and this was when l dopa was being developed That's and right. uh he uh, right. essentially experimented on these individuals um, uh, giving them L-DOPA to see what happened. And it induced mm-hmm. profound changes. And some of these people who had basically been catatonic for years woke up uh, and were all of a sudden, at least for a period of time, pretty close to normal. Oh, that's the but movie all, with, uh, what's it? Yeah, Robin yeah, Williams. Yeah, the movie yeah. is Robin Williams. Yeah, and right. uh, so, it's the, the movie is Robin Williams and um, hmm. Robert De Niro. Right. Okay. Yeah, so. I have not seen the movie, <laughs> but the movie is based on, it focuses on one of these uh, cases, uh, I think embellished with bits from the others. As a matter of fact, Sachs talks in the book about, in an epilogue to the book, about uh, the making of the movie and talking to De Niro and Robin Williams uh, as they were making the movie and sort of uh, advising on the whole thing. Uh, at any rate, it's, and the L Dopa treatment, you know, it wasn't. Uh, it was um, not completely successful. These people would relapse. There was uh, all kinds of issues that came up, but it's a fascinating story. True. I have an well, addendum on this one because okay. there's a personal connection here because I had the privilege once of being asked to give a TED Talk, and that was in 2009. That was the same year that Oliver Sacks was asked to give a TED Talk. So I got to meet Robin Williams. <laughs> oh. And I didn't know who Oliver, Oliver Sacks was at the time because I had never heard of him before, except through the grapevine, of course. And the next thing you know, he was being recruited by Columbia <laughs> and ended up mm. here as a neurologist and uh, unfortunately passed away not too long uh, after and that. I, I have a PS here, as long, uh, an unrelated PS or cl- distantly related PS, as long as we're doing um, – picks and i've got the mic i'm reading lab girl mm. uh, oh, good. which was which was picked by welkin and if you've read this kathy i have not it's on my list have any of you guys read this Mm-mm. i have not uh do it mm. it's okay. it's great it's okay. really good you, you picked a similar book kathy didn't you some time ago which was a- uh not having read lab girl i'm not sure how similar what i picked was is i'm thinking i'm gonna send a copy of this to joan (laughs) i think she'd really like it it's got all kinds of stuff in it but one of the things that it has in it big time is being a woman in science yeah yeah it's very well done she writes really brilliantly i like his book oliver sacks wrote a book called the man who mistook his wife for a hat and other clinical Mm -hmm. tales i've always liked Mm -hmm. that title that's correct I think I read that one yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> he wrote a lot he's of books. got a whole bunch of them. He's got a bunch of books. You know, he's, he was an amazing individual. And I, I saw him once on an interview with uh, Charlie Rose. And um, he had a condition. He was a neurologist, but he couldn't recognize people's faces. Hmm. 
he didn't, you know, if he saw you one day, he would say, hello, Vincent, and because you told him who you were. Mm -hmm. And the next day, he would just walk right by you as if he had never met you before. And you say, what the heck is all that about? Then they had, knows you. That's right. And then they had a, well, hmm, God bless you. <laughs> a lot of people do that anyway with Vincent, but no, that's not right. I'll be nice to Vincent. The, the other guy that had that was Chuck Close, uh. the artist, and he became obsessed with doing portraits of his own face as a result. Alan, what's the name of it again? Prosopagnosia. Hmm. Prosopagnosia. One of the interesting things about this uh, book is is just the disease itself, encephalitis yeah. lethargica, because I think this was a legitimate epidemic. It sure. apparently is some sort of autoimmune disease, hmm. uh, but it smells like something where there's an infection that triggers this by, uh, you know, cross recognition of some antibody that's made with a hmm. with a, a protein in your cell. But they and uh, there's some suspicion that maybe there's something causal in the 1918 flu epidemic that was going on at the same time, but maybe not blah, blah, blah. So it's a there real are, mess. there are similar <laughs> conditions that can be caused chemically. Hmm. I was going to uh, say maybe it's some weird additive in some snake oil. Right. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the frozen addicts story, um, yeah, where right. heroin, heroin users got a bad batch. There and you go. There you ended up these these otherwise I mean they were heroin users but they were otherwise relatively healthy people and they ended up in a condition that was very much like very late stage Parkinson's they were frozen yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it was because of this uh, this compound that was contaminating the drug that they'd got um, mm -hmm. and it, it destroyed oh forget the the structure in the brain that's um, like also damaged in Parkinson's disease. Um, anyway. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds like a neat story. Kathy, what do you have? I picked something that I happened to read while I was eating lunch. So many of you may get this free journal biotechniques. And so I think this is all hmm. open access stuff because it's so heavily advertising based, but uh, it's a, there's an first I read the editorial by Nathan Blow, and then his article, uh, where he looks at how efforts to create guidelines and scoring systems could change the way you buy antibodies. And so he reports on a meeting at the Asilomar Conference Center a year ago, September 2016, which maybe others heard about, but I didn't. And it makes the point about how we need to come together to work out ways to validate antibodies. And it's not reasonable for to expect vendors to do it for all possible applications and conditions. It's not uh, reasonable to expect bench scientists to do it all for at least for basic validation tests. Each time they get a new antibody, it's not the responsibility of journals or grant funding organizations. But having all of those uh, kinds of groups come together, evidently was part of what happened at this conference. And uh, there's a cr pretty cool flowchart in here, which evidently is picked up from another journal earlier. But one possibility is that there will be a scoring solution. And so they expect that to come out uh, any day now, the fall of 2017, in some kind of beta test where they would score a limited number of antibodies and evaluate that scheme before it's rolled out for wider use. So, you know, we've talked before about the problem of reproducibility and validating things. And, of course, now validation is a, something you have to write about in your NIH grants. And I was just unaware of this whole effort and thought it was worth telling some others about. Yes. And if you wait a couple of weeks, there will be a story appearing in the back section um, of Science which will also be put online on the advertiser supported section for free access that dives in depth into this very same issue and discusses the Asilomar conference and some of the controversies surrounding the scoring system uh, and some of the efforts that people have, have suggested as well for, um, for tracking the validity of antibodies. Would and, we, actually, and who would the... Would the, would the, the we're all so curious, Alan. I Tell us happen, how you know about this. I happen this. to have some inside information <laughs> having been resident inside the head of the author at the time he was writing it. Outstanding. Um, so, yeah, this is this is a really juicy issue um, mm -hmm. that as I, as I dug into it, I, I thought, wow, 
I didn't know any of this. And then it turns out, of course, most people who work with antibodies routinely don't know any of this. Um, the, the whole supply chain for these things is largely opaque. Um, so I believe it's Wuhan, China is mm -hmm. a major center of antibody production. Just know. like Shenzhen is where your, your electronic devices come from. And these are produced by companies you have likely never heard of. Huh. They're not named on the label, but you order from some major uh, bio supplier mm -hmm. and you get something from one company and it's labeled as this antibody and you use it. And it cut, maybe it doesn't work so well for your assay. So you go to some other company and you order uh, their, their antibody against the same thing. What you don't realize is that you just bought the same antibody. <laughs> Because all these companies are just relabeling the same oh product God. from the same original manufacturer in Wuhan. Uh, there are also companies that make their own antibodies and sell them under their own brand. But this it's this whole mess that people don't realize this huge diversity of antibodies you think you're choosing from is actually a much smaller set from just repeated over and over again. You know, it's sad when you buy them from different companies you often get different results yes <laughs> mm -hmm. uh well you can you can also you are often getting different products but you don't know sometimes you may get the same thing sometimes you may get the same and, thing sometimes you may get something different mm -hmm. and you don't have any way of tracing that supply chain back uh there was one company that i i talked to the ceo for the article a company called one world lab which was dealing with this by selling sample kits of genuinely unique antibodies. And they genuinely they, unique, <laughs> genuinely like, is okay, each molecule unique or is no, it? Well, no, but, um, but they, they actually provided traceability to the original manufacturer. So they were trying to introduce transparency into the process. And the great thing about it was you could buy 10 different antibodies against your antigen and know that they were really 10 different antibodies. And you got small aliquots of them that you could test out. The problem was people would do that. They would figure out which one worked and then they would go directly to the original manufacturer to buy it. Mm. And One World Lab's business model was actually that they were going to hopefully become your supplier. But people would just bypass them as soon as they figured out which antibody they needed. Um, so they folded. But yeah, this is this is a really interesting issue. And the Biotechniques article does a good job. Um, describing it. I don't feel like I got scooped. I, I feel like there's additional additional information that my article will provide. But this well, is Well, you really should good. feel free to do a self-serving pick when it comes out. I yeah. may do that. <laughs> so I'm looking at this uh, flow chart. There's an awful lot of paths that lead to abandoned antibody. Yes. yes. And, the, and the, path, the path that leads to validated antibody ready for use is pretty tortuous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can, I can certainly say from my own experience that I had a lot of abandoned antibody experiences. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, when you when it publishes, let us know. Pick it. We'll talk about it some more. All right. Uh, my pick is a little book based on the very famous <laughs> Goodnight Moon great. by Wa Margaret Wise Brown, which I used to love to read to my kids because it's just – it's a nicely illustrated book – I'm sure everyone knows with just yes. this wonderful pacing that is, I don't know, it's just, I think it's great for putting, used to put me to sleep. Yes. <laughs> In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon. Mm. And I love the part, and a quiet old lady who was whispering hush. Green, hush. And then uh, then this good night, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, what is it, a rabbit or something starts to say good night to all the objects, you know, good night light, good night clocks, and finally good night to the old lady whispering hush. I just loved it. It has a wonderful cadence. It's it's just beautiful. So now we have good night lab, which is a parody of this, and uh, the same primary colors. <laughs> and yes. in the great green lab, there was a laser and a lab notebook and a picture of Einstein with a stern look. <laughs> It's been a long day at the lab for this scientist. Now it's time to say good night. Good night, laser. Good night, notebook. Good night, picture of Einstein with a stern look. <laughs> so it's nice. I mean, the, you know, it's probably not great to copy something else, but I guess you could call it a parody. And anything that it is. introduces kids to science uh, is okay by me. Absolutely. 
Then we have two, we have three listener picks. We heard one from Paul already, the um, story of Pasteur's apprentice who tried mm-hmm. to control something in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Maureen who writes, in this anti-science atmosphere, there is an important series which I recommend you binge on and promote to keep mm-hmm. our scientists involved and funded. The series is First in Human, a Discovery Channel program which follows four patients who have no hope and are given the first trials of never-before-tried treatment at the NIH. The series is stunning and riveting and highlights the need for continued basic and bedside treatment. For those least fortunate in health, you will not be able to turn it off. Mm. I'm a clinical research nurse who cares for these patients at NIH, NIAID, and works with the doctors and sees the day-to-day successes and failures. Mm. It is heartbreaking when we fail, Mm. but overwhelming when we succeed and send these patients back to a real life. The series can be gotten on demand, or the six hours can be purchased at Amazon for $6 and better spent money than on any two-hour movie. <laughs> Discovery. Okay, that's cool, Maureen. Uh, I haven't seen this. Has anyone seen it? No. no. I knew one of the patients, though. We should see it. I, I actually visited him many times before he passed, oh. and uh, it was very sad. They tried his interferon test. He had a weird form of leukemia and um, several relapses over a three or four year period. And um, very courageous man. We have a little. Uh, the, the, generally, the people who do any of this stuff are courageous. Absolutely it's amazing. Not afraid at all. He says, "Do anything you want. Just I wanted this thing off me." And uh, for a while, it did work, but of mm. course, not altogether. And we also have a pick from Pete. You remember Pete was uh, the one talking about. GMO salmon, etc. <laughs> right. His listener pick is Change Agent by David Suarez. The projection of gene editing tech into the near future is very interesting, especially the first chapter where prospective parents worry that having unedited progeny will leave them disadvantaged <laughs> compared to modified peers. It gets pretty fantastic, but not more fantastic than the concept of editing genes was 40 years ago. I liked the discussion of caterpillars changing into butterflies. It's also a great read. And to loop back to GMO food, <laughs> Silicon Valley has moved to Singapore because of the anti-GMO climate in the U.S. I have to say, I haven't read this, but I have read some other David Suarez books. And one I remember very clearly, some federal agents coming to a farmer and saying, we've tested your seeds, you're using Monsanto. It's not Monsanto, but the implication, it's a company that sounds like Monsanto. You've right. stolen their tech, their gene-modified seeds, and we're shutting down your farm, so it's obviously, you know. You can see where, the, where Pete would like <laughs> David Suarez. Indeed. And that does it for TWIV458, which you can find at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send your questions and comments to us, TWIV at microbe.tv, and consider supporting us if you like what we do. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute for the different ways you can do that. Dixon de Pommier, de Pommier photo art.com. Check it out. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, Dixon. No, it's a collaborative effort. Love it. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. I'm happy to be back. You're welcome. Get, get better. Back. <laughs> Good to have you back. Rich Condit, an emeritus professor at the University of Florida Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com on Twitter as well, and also turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, and I want to thank the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The introductory music on TWIV is performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>